Thanks for having us here. This is really great. And thanks again to the sponsors for helping us get here. Um, it's All right, so, so what we wanted to talk to you about today, so we work on, the, on this tool called Surge, and we'll get to what it does. But we wanted to talk to you more about how it's built, um, because it, it is a little different than most like web services and web applications. So um, you guys may recognize this, or it may look a little unfamiliar to you, because this is NPM3. Um, but this is when you, when you install an application, you get these progress bars, or, or traditionally with NPM, you get this stream of data, right? And um, you know, it was, I was always kind of curious like exactly how that paradigm works and how um, NPM gives you like a session and you don't have to leave your command line in order to publish a module and, and things like that. And, and what, what I found that was like just really excellent about this is how you can just stay focused in the context of where you're at. Because as soon as you open up your browser, there's like a million distractions, right? And you end up on Hacker News or Reddit or wherever, um, or uh, checking out like the tennis data. Um, so, so anyways, like we wanted to keep developers where they are and, and just explore like how we can remove as many paper cuts as possible from just the publishing experience of putting something online. So what we ended up with is, is surge.sh. And it basically works like this. If you were to create an index.html file, um, you can um, publish it, or you can install it. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll move on. I'll just demo it to you. Um, but basically, so what's, what's important to us about working on the command line is that um, when we're working on this tool that helps you publish to the browser, we actually realized it was possible to um, abandon the browser so you didn't need to involve it in that workflow. With front-end developers working more and more on the command line, um, we thought it was important to have a tool that, that kept them there. So um, so how about we uh, yeah. demo this? Yeah, we'll, we'll demo search right here. OK. So I'm on, I'm on Chemist Machine here, and I'm sure everyone knows what it's like to program on someone else's computer. But anyway. Um, so, so the basic premise is this. So I've got a project here already. Um, and inside it is an index.html file and a 404.html file. Um, and if I cat the index.html file, it's just like hello world, hello LA. Um, and if you want to get this online, like what, how would you do that, right? So, You'd maybe create a Git repo and, and put it up on uh, GitHub pages as an option or, or whatever. Um, so, what we kind of felt like it could be more ubiquitous than that, right? So, if you think of like some tools that you use every day, like you're moving a directory, um, like uh, just go back. Let's say we wanted to move my project and we wanted to rename it to Foo Project. Right? Like you could do it just like that. And I was thinking like publishing to the web should be that easy, but instead of foo project, like you would say um, you would say la.syntaxy.com and um, of course instead of MV, you would do something like search, right? Well we can actually just run that. So it's gonna prompt us for uh, email. And a password, and I didn't get the password right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, so we just deployed that. Let's check it out. And I promise you, this isn't canned. That just deployed. So that's online. You can check it on your phone. Um, and and the premise here is just basically like like what we wanted to talk to you about is just like. OK, so I didn't put the right password in a few times, and that wasn't even intentional. But like, it prompted me to re-enter it. And then um, it confirms the project path and the size of the project. And then it gives us a progress bar. Of course, this was a trivial in size, so it was very quick. Um, and then it propagates on our servers and uh, gives you an IP address that, that you can use. Um, but what we, what we realize is that there isn't a lot of paradigms for these sorts of things, like, like how you handle your session. Um, yeah, we can go back to this. So like that content stream, how you get data from the server to the client, and how you uh, handle your session management, 
um, your payments. Uh, it's obviously a good idea to, to take payment and your yeah. Some user of the, interface. The user interface challenges, like uh, just because a command line is something with that's been around for a while and a different audience sometimes is using it doesn't mean it shouldn't provide a, a quality user experience and a, and a good user interface. And the last thing we want to walk you through as well is some of the, the gotcha, some of the things we encountered while building these command line tools. So whether you're um, making something like NPM or something like Surge or, Surge or um, something else in the command line, uh, there's a lot of possibilities of where you can go beyond basic command line tools. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk to you about. So the first thing is content streams. Yeah, so these are kind of the, the basic building blocks, right, that, that we discovered. And we want to share these with you. So um, is this a? Um, OK. Got it. OK, so, so the step one is, is basically, how do you get that stream of data from, from the server to the client? And, um, and I just wanted to show it to you. We'll just like code it up right now. And we'll start with, like, everyone here has like, done the hello world in Node.js. Or raise your hand if, you, if you've used Node.js. OK, everyone. And so I assume people have ran this. They've made a, a, a web server. So let's um, start with that. OK. Uh, so I've got this examples directory. And um, so here's, here's that copy and pasted, essentially verbatim, um, hello world from, that, uh, from the Node.js site. So if we run this. And we uh, curl. We get hello world. And you have, you have mail, Kenneth. Oh, so do I. Um, Deal with that later. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth's got like this really creative reminder system thing in his terminal. Uh, anyway, you're, you're seeing it in action. <laughs> um, it's probably reminding me to turn it off. <laughs> yeah. OK. So coming back to this, so, so everyone's like following me so far. We got hello world, right? So let's take this to the next level. And we'll just open up the same file we just edited. And we're just going to make a few tweaks to this. So the first thing we're going to do is just change the content type. And this isn't really required, but it just makes it more semantically correct. So content stream. This is like tells the client, gives a, the client an idea of how to interpret the data that it's about to get. So you can call that really whatever you want. Um, and then next, like we're just going to we're going to respond with the 200 status code, and we're going to have a delay before we um, before we end end the connection. So the 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 server is really in control of when the um, when the connection closes. So we'll just do a set timeout here. And we'll do five seconds. And just tell me if I do something wrong here. And oh, yeah, we're just going to move this here. And uh, let's just run this now. So let's restart that. And we'll start this. And now it's hanging, OK? It's going to hang for five seconds, and then it'll give us the response, hello world. So we need to just take this one level further. And of course, this is a contrived example, but like your server is going to do real work here, right? So we're going to go um, in an interval. Um, in here, we're going to uh, we're going to create a timestamp and um, new date and to JSON, and then we're going to response dot write um, JSON dot string if I. So what we're going to do is we're going to send 
um, line delimited JSON payloads through the stream. So it's just like JSON chunk after JSON chunk, right? So in here, this will be, oh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, so timestamp is TS. And we're going to concatenate a line break on that. Does that look right? Sorry? <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. I was, um, I was in. Like that. All right, thank you. I need what? Oh, I'm going to run this and see how it complains. <laughs> OK. You know, I was, I noticed Kyle Simpson speaking net next month, and he was heckling me uh, in Denmark when I was doing a presentation. Yeah, anyway, um, I don't use semicolons. Uh, no, but I don't apologize for it either. OK, so this is the same thing, but you know, after five seconds, this is going to um, close. Uh, let's actually just tweak this slightly. Um, I'm going to actually put an interval time here. Uh, so it's not so fast. And then in our, uh, before we close, we should actually clear this interval. I know that was bothering somebody in here. <laughs> Good on you for being quiet. OK. So let's run this one more time. And we'll just curl that. OK, so we've got these events emitting. This could be moving things on servers and, or whatever you want. Um, we're still responding with hello world. That should be another JSON payload, right? But um, you know how NPM, it says like, if this is successful, it will end with OK. Um, well, it just ends with like um, a payload of, of OK, basically. Um, now, the reason for that is, um, we'll all get back to why, why, why that is a, a useful thing to do. Um, anyway, um, let's move on. Does anyone have any questions about what we just did there? So, so basically, like HTTP already gives us what we need to, to just stream data, right? Like HTTP is good at streaming. We watch a lot of YouTube videos, right? So, um, and this also actually, Patrick, might have been useful for, um, for getting your, your stream to the client. Um, sockets are good because it's a two-way communication. But when you just need to go from a server to a client, then this is really like all you need, basically. OK. It's such a good, you got to spend more time on that slide. It looks so good. <laughs> right. Kenneth, Kenneth makes everything look really amazing. And I mess it up. Anyway. <laughs> um, OK, so the next thing, once you have that stream, like obviously like authentication and a session is pretty important when you're offering a service to somebody. And um, an NPM has that concept. Like you can NPM publish. You don't need to go to the website to do that or anything like that. And um, and there's this useful thing, like uh, for those who build single page apps, like um, who here has used local storage for tokens or anything like that, or just used local storage? OK. So it's basically, for those who don't know, local storage is in your browser. And you can, it's basically a key value store. And it's very basic. It's synchronous, so you can't do like crazy stuff in there. But when you need to store a token and then use that to talk to a service, then it's, it's quite perfect for that. Um, so obviously, we, we don't have local storage, uh, and that us should be capitalized, but we don't have local storage in, uh, in, on our systems, but we have something actually very similar that can achieve the same thing. And that's basically uh, it's your net RC file. 
So your netrc file is, um, it, it, you, could, you could cat this on your machine right now and you're, you will probably see something. Um, Heroku uses it to, to store tokens in there. It looks like this, thanks Kenneth. Um, and if you've used Surge, uh, like that's how we store the tokens in, in the system. That isn't my token, so don't try to hack my, my account. Um, but basically what we, what we have here is, is a way to just like put, put some basic data into, um, onto people's system and then we have like, we now have a session. So you can install a module called NetRC, which makes this really simple. And now uh, let's talk about taking payments. So it turns out um, taking payments is kind of useful, right? Like, especially if you're trying to run a business and have, uh, like, you need money to do that, right? So we kind of, like, there was this pie in the sky idea, like, oh, a PCI compliant way to take credit cards through the terminal, right? Like, wouldn't that be cool? And since we were already keeping everyone there anyways, that was our goal about letting front-end developers focus on publishing to the web and what they're already building. It seemed natural that the way we were hoping they would upgrade their projects um, should also be there as well. But um, we kind of second-guessed ourselves and went with the backup option first and tried that out. Yeah, I kind of got talked off the cliff a little bit with that. Like, they were like, Brock, like, just don't bother. Like, let's just keep it really simple. Like, because I was thinking, we're gonna need like Phantom JS and like pass data through and do all this trickery in order to like get the security environment that's going to allow that to work, right? But so at first we're like, okay, we have a token already on someone's machine. All we really need to do is open up a browser and we can just give them a credit card form and Bob's your uncle, we can move on. Um, and so we implemented this. We, we, this was our plan B and we're like, yeah, it's foolproof, right? So we were going to um, use the open library, OPN, and it's really useful. It just opens up like whatever program you, you want it to. And we were gonna pass through the, um, the token through the, the URL. And, and the reason for that is, is so that the browser will hide it um, once it loads and we'll get that session passed from the terminal, leaving people's local machine into the browser. So we implemented this. And it worked in Firefox, we're like, cool. And then we tested it on Chrome and IE, and we're like, oh, shoot, OK. Um, apparently, this is an attack vector. And so um, Chrome and IE have like, locked it down. And like, in theory, it should work. But um, for security reasons, they've, they've shut those doors. And it turns out nobody really typically needs that, except when you're doing weird stuff like we are. So, we went back to the drawing board and we're like, okay, well, our only real option is to go back to plan A and see if we can make this work. And so um, it turns out when, when, you go, when you look at the basic building blocks of like PCI compliant like way of taking credit cards, um, it makes sense that, that there, this is worth exploring. So in this example, we've got, we've got Kim here and she wants to buy a shirt, a JSLA shirt, and she needs to give money to David. So how does David take money in a way where he doesn't see Kim's credit card information, right? That's the basic principle of, of um, how credit card taking works on the web today. So the way it works is that David will present um, a payment form to Kim. Usually this happens in the browser and she will fill it out. And what actually happens is that the credit card information doesn't go back to JSLA. It goes to Stripe and over a, a secure connection and Stripe will reply with a token that's going to like expire after a certain amount of time. And also they're, they're aware that it's a token that's meant for JSLA. So once that token gets returned back to the browser, the browser passes that off to David at JSLA, and now he can charge that and send that shirt over to Kim. So what we essentially did is the exact same thing, and this works, um, but you just use a terminal instead of a browser. It's actually brilliantly simple. So it turned out this actually wasn't difficult at all. Um, 
after going home really frustrated one day, we just like, the next day we had it working. So if you, um, if you use a paid feature in search, um, you're gonna get prompted, uh, it'll look like this, and, um, and yeah, it, it, it's going to um, do the same thing. It's gonna send your credit card information off to the Stripe, Stripe returns with a token, and then that token gets sent off to, to us. And we can do all the same things you would expect in the browser, like remember um, a credit card number, the main one on your account, and um, other things like that. It, it really is just another client in the exact same way you would expect it to be. Yeah, that's a good point, which brings us to, to the next stage. And Yeah, so there's a lot of conventions around how you would do that in the browser, but not as many in the terminal, not as many precedents. So when we're doing the, the core parts of the command line interface, there's a lot of tools we can draw from um, for the basics, but we also had to explore some extra things like that. Yeah, so um, there's a great module called Commander for building um, CLIs. Uh, there's one which is by TJ. There's Yargs, which came from Optimist, which was written by Substack. And then the successor of Optimist were Minimist. The truth is you could use any of these tools and they're great. Um, they all work like almost completely differently from each other, but they're all very capable tools. Um, but that still doesn't solve everything. Like these, these are still just, they're just frameworks that help you. But like how should a form work? How should, how should you give user feedback when their credit card is wrong or that they didn't put in a valid email address? Like all of these things like came up and they were, um, and I don't even know if we got them all right. I know we didn't, but there wasn't these es established expectations about how you interact um, from, a, from a user experience standpoint. And I think one of the strangest things is that since you always have to return, you can't provide inline validation all the time. And so we're still experimenting what, what people find conventional about uh, ORM inputs. Are, are placeholders understood as placeholders? Are error messages understood as error messages? And um, all of this should hopefully contribute to a better user experience on the command line, just in the same way these principles contribute to a better user experience in the browser. Yeah, so, so in this case, like, we're not even giving a feedback message, we're just prompting for the email again. And then you may have noticed that, that your input from the last one still remained, um, so that you don't have that situation where you fill out a full form and then one thing isn't wrong and you gotta refill it out. And ju just things like that. So th these things were really real challenges for us and, and we, we still haven't figured it all out. But. And when you're... Um, kind of exploring what's conventional and not, you also get to ask what's weird and not, or what's weird or not weird in the command line. So one thing we experimented with was actually having icons that to go as labels. Um, this totally works. These are emojis in the command line. Who, um, who knew that this was even possible? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's oh, right. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. So it's the same the same principle, but rather than sort of just a rather than just being an emoji, we wanted it to be icons that would actually trigger context about what you were doing. And we even tried to sort of supersede the system emoji font so we could design our own custom icon font. But um, which uh, actually technically should work, right? It's like it's we in the pretty, spec, but nobody we got pretty far with it. it. <laughs> Um, but it turns out that even though it's technically possible, it's still really bizarre or unfamiliar to see these in the command line. So it's one of those things where you have to ask, is it better to be um, more normal or more expected or do something strange to provide a better user experience? So it's still something we're figuring out, but it's a really interesting problem. Mm -hmm. And that also brings us to some of the, the gotchas, the other things we encountered along the way of building these more advanced command line tools. Yeah, that's right. So, so the first thing, and, and probably the most important, is the security model. So the browser's evolved over all these years, and it, like, essentially, like, it's gotten become this rich platform, so we don't really notice this, but like, really, uh, at its essence, what the browser does is it protects the user, and so it allows these vendors to um, create apps and programs and websites and whatever that, um, that can do interesting things, but the user doesn't have to worry about like their system getting like compromised. And this still isn't true. There's still challenges, right, with cookie tracking and things like that. And the browser still has lots of work to do. Um, but if you're building a tool, a command line tool or service, or any CLI for that matter, um, it's really on you to protect the user. And and as a user, it's really on you to protect yourself. So like, make sure you trust the people. Um, 
of the tools that you're using and and if you're if you're a, a developer building one like be be respectful about people's computers because they've trusted you by installing their uh, program or yeah, on their machine, and and really, it's on you to to do the right thing and, and to be mindful, even of like what directories you read or how you touch the file system, and and so like search, for example, the only time it touches the file system ever is is the netrc file, um, just to read that. Uh, the when it when it deploys a, a directory, it actually just like. Um, Tars it and gzips it in memory, and it streams it right up to the server, and and that's because we just didn't want to just be like mucking with your file system, right? Um, and it's also in line with those emoji things. Um, it's also an opportunity to question what the constraints of the terminal are, and if you can use those to an advantage or not. So um, you can use colors in the terminal, pretty basic colors, um, but they're actually something that are user specified. So you can install modules like chalk and say I want this text to be gray, run, and this text to be green, surge. Um, but it turns out that different themes interpret this differently, different terminal clients interpret the colors differently, and they're all user specified. So um, how you think they're going to look doesn't actually really mean that much. So sometimes you have to use that constraint to your advantage and just say this text is going to be dim instead of specifically going to be gray. And use constraints to an advantage in the terminal. It's um, sometimes limited feature set means even though there are these additional things like uh, colors or the ability to change the font specified, it's very, very rare that they actually work as you expect. So um, we have to build user interfaces in the terminal that account for that. Yeah, you almost have to always be more like conservative than you'd like to be just because like even just getting things to run on like uh, an OS 10 and Linux and Windows, like there's some big challenges there and always things that you don't expect. Um, status code is the other thing. So, so I said I'd come back to like why NPM does like the hey, everything was okay at the end. Um, this is a good idea because like like every developer relies on status codes to a different degree. But like if you're someone who really adheres to them, they're they're very useful. Um, but in this situation, um, when you're opening up this this stream of data, and you might have to deny somebody to be able to deploy an application because um, they don't have permission to deploy to that URL, or um, maybe their credit card information is invalid, or they don't have proper um, payment information. Um, so basically, your status code is only useful in like that initial opening up of the connection, and and then after that, you kind of have to come up with your own paradigms in order to to do those things. Um, one of the other challenges is platforms. So. We make sure our tests can run on OS 10 and also run on Windows, and some of the times that's not always fun to make that work, but I think it's really important, especially when you're building tools for web developers. You can't necessarily, you shouldn't enforce the preferences that you have um, just because other people might not have that um, opportunity to use different platforms, and we might as well uh, make it available to everyone we can. So. You can do a lot of things using Node to make that easier for you. So for example, if you're passing in a project path, um, in this case it's uh, local directory, rather than splitting on slash, you're going to split on path.seth. And just looking through the docs and making yourself aware of some of the um, operating system niceties that are available in Node will make sure that when your test break or when something happens, probably on Windows, that you'll know that it's for a good cause. It's a good reason, and it's something worth investigating rather than just one of these basic things. Oh, and yeah, even though we couldn't use emojis in the terminal, I can still put them in our comments if I want. <laughs> um, but as, as designers and developers, we advocate for users, and a lot of people using the command line are still running Windows, and I think it's important to include them um, to the best of our ability. Yeah, and, and so what we really wanted to come back to is just like, Creating your tools with like real focus and and like don't be afraid to to try different things and, and we'd like to see more like to see more services like happen in the terminal and more things like happen where where like to me the terminal is like where we get to to live where we're comfortable and anytime like the browser's involved it, it um, you know it's not really like a publisher's um, environment, in my opinion, like I know there's a lot of 
there's a lot of efforts that are really great um, in getting code editing happening through the browser and stuff like that. But, but I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing people get more comfortable on the command line. I think that there's more possibilities that can happen in the terminal if, if we explore it a little further. So, um, so yeah, we'd like to encourage everybody to, to do that. And if you're interested in publishing th things to the web, uh, please check out Surge. Thanks. Thank you. You actually can use Google Analytics in your command line tools um, through a module called Insight. We don't do that right now, partially for the reason that Brock talked about, about respecting people's systems. And um, that kind of opens up a whole other area of like, in addition to being able to access someone's machine, you can also track things about their machine. And we don't necessarily want to make that something we're doing yet, but that option is there for you. Um, right now, we try to book meetings with people who are, book calls with people who are using Surge and talk to them about it. And um, we're lucky in that the command line tool we're building is for developers putting things on the web and they're probably also using GitHub so they're comfortable with coming back to us on GitHub and having a dialogue with us mm -hmm. with issues. But I think like with a lot of design work, it's about um, talking to your, your users and knowing when to listen to their advice and maybe when to set some of their advice aside. Um, but it's it's a learning process for us as well, but an interesting one. Yeah, and I think like in particular because because we can do almost anything to someone's system um, in this context that we've really erred on the side of caution. Like like do nothing. Like we won't even read outside of the directory that that, that you've put in um, as a path. And yeah, we just like. Also, just because this isn't like an established paradigm, and like lots of people aren't building services this way, that like just need to be a little bit more cautious. I think just about like because because you really you could you could find out how much disk space people have and how much RAM they're using, what system they have, and what they're like. You could you could really do a lot of damage and and get information that, that you shouldn't have. And so we just wanted to be really really careful with that. Um, but but that it's an excellent question. I know like I think is Yelman, um, like the first time you run it, it'll a it'll ask you like, can we um, do anonymous um, data collecting um, for the purpose of bettering this tool? And and we might look at doing that sometime in the future. But like for now, we're just like let's keep it really really simple um, initially. Yeah, Chris. Where does uh, search publish to? Oh yeah, so Surge is, um, we use a uh, DigitalOcean um, combination of S3 to propagate on the servers. Um, we, we, serve, we serve with DigitalOcean on the edge nodes and it's a combination of HAProxy, a lot of caching in Redis, and, um, and Node, a lot of Node. And we use ZeroMQ as our uh, message broker, or message system. Um, yep. uh, you guys wrote the, the credit card uh, acceptance yeah. package. Is there any plan to publish that as yeah. a module? Yeah, there is. Um, it's, not, it's not totally obvious yet like where that abstraction point is in, in doing that, but we really want to do that. Um, it's about just like making it into something that, can, that you can plug in and, and, and use it easily. I think we'll get there. Um, it's just a matter of kind of like step one is kind of like making it work and like figuring out how to do it, and then like okay, what what what's the right way to to implement this and and make it um, more concise? Um, but yes, um, we would love to do that. Yeah, and if you're <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you're familiar with some of Brock's work, um, a lot of it is open source as much of it as possible, really. So that's something. I yeah, think that we're curious about exploring, but it also has to be a quality tool for other people to use. And yeah, we don't really hold back process. with opening sor sourcing stuff. It's just about making sure that it like is a useful tool. Otherwise, we end up with a stack of issues that we can't address and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Right? Uh, any other questions? No. Everyone's ready to drink beer. Thanks. All right.
Thanks for having us.